Hey, rock stars, this is Lidge. In this episode, you're about to hear my guest, Frank Filippetti, spoke fondly of one of his close friends and associates, the great Al Schmidt, who sadly we lost a little while after doing this interview. So this episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is dedicated in honor of the great Al Schmidt. Thanks for listening. This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Jay-Z Microphones, Spectra 1964, Atom Audio, and Isotope. You're hearing my voice right now on a Jay-Z pop filter and BB-29 microphone through the Spectra 1964 STX100D Mic Pre and Isotope RX and Ozone, all recorded safely onto an OWC SSD. So get ready to rock. I say this to everybody. If you have talent and you have ambition and are willing to do whatever it takes to make it, you will make it. I absolutely believe that talent at the end and ambition will win out, but you may have to go through a lot of lean years to do it. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. No matter where you like to rock in the galaxy, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron lets you record with confidence over USB-C with up to more than a gigabyte per second real-world performance. Transfer tracks in seconds and take your sessions with you wherever you go. Built for reliability, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron is waterproof, dustproof, and crushproof. Find the new OWC Envoy Pro Electron and all your storage needs at Mac MaxSales.com slash Rockstars. If you're ready to discover the secrets to making your mixes sound great, no matter what your studio situation, then check out my free mixing course, MixMasterBundle.com, where I show you how to get great sounding mixes in your studio using simple techniques and free plugins. And when you're ready for more advanced studio skills, then check out RecordingStudioRockstars.com slash Academy, where you can learn from Grammy-winning teachers to help you record, edit, mix, and master your best record ever. Use the code Rockstar right now at checkout for 10% off any course for a limited time. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Frank Filippetti, a six-time Grammy winner and world-renowned music producer, engineer, and mixer. Born in Bristol, Connecticut and based out of New York since 1971, Frank was one of the first engineers to embrace digital mixing. His early credits include his first number one album, Foreigner's Agent Provocateur, which included the single I Want to Know What Love Is, Foreigner's Inside Information, which he also co-produced, Kiss's Lick It Up, Carly Simon's Coming Around Again, The Bangles' Eternal Flame, Courtney Love's Celebrity Skin, and Rod Stewart's The Great American Songbook, Volumes 1 and 2. Also active in film and theater as well, Frank's work as a producer, engineer, and mixer earned the Aida Broadway Original Cast Album, a Grammy Award for Best Musical Show Album in 2001, and he has since produced Wicked, Spamalot, Disney's Aladdin, The Book of Mormon, and Gigi. I didn't produce the Wicked soundtrack. I, re I recorded and mixed it, but uh, Stephen uh, Schwartz was the producer. Okay, great. His work in film includes the soundtracks for Mike Nichols' Working Girl and Postcards from the Edge, The Pirates of Penzance with Linda Ronstadt and Kevin Klein, Julie Tamor's Across the Universe, Disney's Enchanted, Pixar's Cars, and August Rush, just to name a few. And in addition to his recording and producing talents, Frank has been busy since the early 1980s designing the acoustics for all three right track rooms in New York. In 1999, Frank joined with Simon Andrews to design and build New York City's premier orchestral recording studio. The 
result, Studio A509 was one of the most highly praised sonic achievements in a city known for incredible studios. In 2005, Frank became a founding partner of Meta Alliance, a collaborative community of globally recognized audio engineers and producers that work alongside technology manufacturers to ensure the highest standards of audio production. Thank you so much to Brian Murphy over at Sound Porter Mastering and to Joe D'Ambrosio Management for connecting us. Glad to have you here on the podcast, Frank. Please welcome Frank Filippetti to Recording Studio Rockstars. Frank, are you ready to rock? I'm ready to rock. Uh, where's the audience? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they're, they're in their car going, I'm here, I'm here. Yeah, okay. Hopefully not stuck in traffic right now. <clears throat> I just watched the uh, the Oscars. It was very weird uh, without uh, an audience. It's yeah, a very indeed. weird time we live in. It is indeed a weird time. I'm looking forward to less weird times. Yeah, me too. Um, so I set the scene for us just a little bit. You are joining us from your home studio environment right now. Uh, I think you said you were, you were enjoying a pipe. Spring is That's rolling right. in, even though this will be coming out in colder months. Well, it's uh, I've been here in Waterford now for just over a year. My previous, <clears throat> well, my my main studio work was done at uh, Right Track Recording. That's where I started, and uh, I had been there for and became a co-owner of the studio. That went for about thirty years, and then in two thousand eight or nine, we uh, we gave that up. And uh, I moved to my studio to West Nyack, New York. Um, and I was there for about 10, 15 years. And just last year, moved here just before COVID hit. Are you in a studio environment that you work from now? Yes. My, I'm right now sitting in my room here in Waterford. When we, when we bought the property, one of the things I was looking for was an adjoining building that I could put the studio in. Uh, I found this place. One, it had to be near the ocean. That was very important to me because prior to the Internet, every, you know, I had to be either New York City or Los Angeles or somewhere. And But I've always loved the ocean. And uh, now with the Internet, I realized I could live wherever I wanted to because 90% of my work comes in through the Internet. People send me files or albums or whatever. So I work on them that way and do mostly mixing here. So I wanted a place uh, where I could do that, but now I can live by the ocean. So I found a property by the ocean and has a there was an outbuilding. It was a very small Baptist church that was built in 1815. And uh, I just fell in love with it. And uh, so I moved all my stuff up here last year. And it's all wood uh, with uh, an A-frame ceiling. And it sounds incredible. I hooked up my 9-1 system a couple of months ago. Uh, and I'm starting to work in that format, and uh, I'm just a happy camper. That's amazing. Um, you know, when we were getting started, we had the <clears throat> video camera turned on for a moment, and I could see there was looked like a um, stained glass window sort of off to your side. Is that right? Yeah, well, I have that, but I also have um, I have a uh, uh, a beautiful kind of smell in here. I don't know how to describe it. Uh, it not only looks great, but it smells great. This 200-year-old wood really gets to me. And I, every time I walk in, um, I just love the, the, the smell of it and the feel of it. It's my uh, previous studio uh, in, in West Nyack was, um, was stone, uh, and uh, which also I loved it and sounded great. But this is just a whole other world. So... Um, yeah, stone I'm, stone doesn't have the same smell as a two hundred yeah, year old wood, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I guess you could also say that we've all experienced studios that didn't smell so good. So anything yeah. you can do to make it smell better—that's right. That's right. Well, the, I don't know whether the pipe smoke helps or hurts, but it whatever it is, I love the smell of it when I walk in in the morning. Yeah. Well, as a as a Commander Kurtz, I think it was said at one point, uh, or Kilgore. 
said uh, he loved the smell of napalm in the morning. That's it, right. uh, it smelled like victory. Well, this uh, I love the smell of my studio in the morning. It smells like hit records. <laughs> <laughs> nice, man. Well, so um, maybe let's talk a little bit about more about that, because one of the things that's very cool that I've learned about you is you've really gone out of your way to both develop systems for mixing amazing sounding stuff in in the box, you know, in 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 tools like Pro Tools, but you've also gone out of your way to teach it. I've included a video that I think you had done um, on YouTube. We put that into a playlist. Um, and, you know, your ability to work like this remotely uh, is pretty encouraging. What what are some of the tools that you surround with yourself with right now? You know, you said you set up a 9.1 system. Maybe break that down for us a little in case that's sort of new territory for us. All right. Well, uh, there are uh, currently there are three, uh, the three most popular, probably maybe four immersive audio systems for music are the uh, the Dolby Atmos, Oro 3D, DTS, and uh, the Sony 360. So I've been working in in various formats, and I've currently locked into the Sony 360. One, because I like the fact that you can stream it in a headphone format and still get some of that immersive audio. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of people aren't going to have a 9-1 or an 11-1 system in their home to listen back to this stuff. So it's nice to know that uh, you have something where you don't lose everything when you go to stereo. That's one of the reasons I like Sony. Uh, the other is all the other systems have pluses and minuses. I've had real trouble with the Dolby Atmos system because with Pro Tools and Dolby Atmos, they don't allow you to do a 714 bus, which is how I mix. So it's always been a real trial to try to get my mixes in that format they tell you to do a you know a 5-1 bus and a four channel bus what they don't tell you is well because of that you don't get uh, the delay compensation on the two different buses they each uh, delay compensate without uh, referencing the other so every time you put a plug in across one of the buses or on a on a track you have to you have to uh, fix the delay compensation by adding delay or not. So that becomes a pain. Yeah. Then they said, well, if you want it, the other way to do it is put everything, you know, uh, apart from your bed, put everything in, in objects. But what they don't tell you is the objects go directly to the renderer, which bypass delay compensation entirely. So again, every time you want to do something or try something new, you have to change. Uh, you have to change the delay. So I find it very cumbersome. Yeah, um, delay compensation is one of those things that we should just not even have to worry about. That's how exactly. I you know, <laughs> I mean, it's 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 you know, in the analog world, we don't worry about it, and uh, you know, and and the. For the most part, you know, the Steinbergs and the and the Avids and so forth have been very good at making it kind of a no-brainer. But once you get into multi-channel work, Pro Tools falls apart. And in fact, they just came out with a new a new uh, Pro Tools version, and they've been telling me for two or three years they're going to give us a 714 bus, and they still haven't done it. So I'm moving on. In the meantime, uh, the Oro format, which I happen to like quite a lot, but it's just not that popular here in the U.S. It's more a European system, but I do like it. Sony is putting a big push on the 360A format, and um, uh, I quite like it. So I wanna, I'm uh, doing an album now in that format, um, and I'm, you know, I don't know when I can talk about it, but by the time this airs, I can probably talk about it. But in the meantime, it's a very exciting project. Hopefully, if this goes well, that will be my my preferred format. So how, how should we think about it? If we're, um, well, first of all, if we're in our home studios and making records, do we want to think about formats like these for mixing music? Um, is this? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, well then, how how should we begin to think about it? We right. we have to choose a format and go in, in that direction, 
And then if we mix something in the 9.1 format, uh, you were saying that translates to stereo, or do we need to think about doing a stereo mix and then think about doing a 9.1 mix? Well, on most of these formats, yes, that's that's the case. You need to think about the do the 9.1 and then do your own stereo mix. However, the Sony system, they've been working long and hard on doing this to create a stereo mix uh, with uh, some immersion characteristics, uh, which you can listen to in headphones. It's like a binaural thing, but it uh, it does a pretty good job of placing things. They're still working on it. They're still getting it better. Dolby has their own system too, but I don't like it as much. But I think we all have to realize that whatever we do in immersive audio, we have to recognize how people are going to be listening to this in the home. You know, back in the days of DVD audio and so forth, you had a DVD audio player. And uh, as long as you had your 5.1 system up, you could play it that way. But a lot of people are just going to listen to this either on headphones or um, an Amazon Echo or something like that, which, you know, they're not going to have a 9.1 or an 11.1 system in their home. Yeah, It's very important that uh, any of these systems translate to two speakers, four speakers, five speakers, seven speakers, nine speakers, 11 speakers. They, in other words, you have to have a codec that can help you produce something resembling your mix and depend, you know, uh, with reference to the consumer uh, and what they have in their home. So as long as you tell your your device, uh, your amplifier or receiver, what it is, what your speakers are. You have a, I have a left center right and a surround, let's say, um, or I have just a two channel system or I have a three channels. Once you feed that into the unit, it should be able to give you a reasonable facsimile of your mix in any of those formats. Here at the studio for the, the Sony 360, I have five JBL M2s, which are my left, center, right, left surround, and right surround. Then I have uh, two JBL subs for the LFE. And then I have four JBL 705s, which are the smaller speakers, uh, but they're, they're based on the same technology as the M2s. And those are my four height channels. Which are meaning they're above your head, sort of like left they're and above right, your, front, left and right. They're above your head. Yeah, they're above your head, left center, uh, left, right, left surround, and right surround. And I'm in the process now of getting two 708 JBLs, uh, which will be two what they call bottom speakers in the uh, in the Sony format. Sony not only has height speakers and your your standard speakers, which are ear level, but they also have bottom speakers. You can have up to three of those. So now do we start putting a mic on foot tapping in the studio and, That's and directly right. on the kick pedal and just throw it That's down there? That's it. That's <laughs> it. Well, you know, it's funny. You, you say that. And uh, one of the things I've noticed when I go to uh, listen to demos of Atmos or, or uh, Oro or some of these other things, Many times, even though you're placing your vocal in the uh, on the uh, the airplane, the vocal tends somehow to seems to be coming from higher. By having uh, by having some things below that, it's it's better to center that vocal and so forth, and mm. other things obviously uh, that you want to put there, uh, not just sub things, but other things too. The ear is amazingly uh, sensitive to picking up audio cues from, especially in front of you, uh, in these, in the height and width. And so, it, if you have your speaker set up properly and all the phases are correct and the timings are all correct, it really does provide uh, what what they call an immersive experience. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It's exciting stuff. Um, I guess most of us wouldn't necessarily have a ton of speakers set up perfectly. Does it make sense for us to learn how to mix just in a pair of headphones and then hope that that will translate to a system that has the speakers everywhere? Well, I mean, in in, in the stereo world, we do that already. I mean, I've 
I've been on the road. Last year, I was uh, I took a vacation with uh, with my family to this was before COVID hit to Italy. Uh, while I was there, I got a call to to do a couple of mixes on my laptop, which I was able to do. But you have to do it on headphones or on a very small set of speakers. Mm-hmm. In today's world. Uh, we're always checking on headphones anyway, because, you know, more people hear your music on headphones, I think, than any other way. We always want to make sure that it translates well to headphones. I've got a couple of different pairs of headphones that I use, which kind of give me an overall perspective. Uh, I use the Odyssey uh, headphones uh, because they sound so amazing and they have such great low end. I also use a a pair of Sony uh, headphones, not the 7506s. I'm not a fan of those, but they're called the Sony Professional. There's no model number on them, but those are pretty good for the mid-range. I'm working now with the the folks at the Sony 360 uh, and getting um, a pair of the, uh, the, the Sony 360 headphones, which actually you have a HRTF uh, calibration uh, of your ear canals and stuff. And then you, you, you send that to them and then they, you know, the headphone is designed specifically for your ears. So that allows a lot of that immersive information to, to couple with your own ears, uh, in, uh, to get that immersive sound and that sonic texture, uh, even with headphones. Right. And that's because, um, Binaural is the process of creating a th- fully three-dimensional sound with just two inputs, just your left ear and your right ear. But in order to do that correctly, it really needs to get the, um, you know, all the details of phasing and frequency response just right. And a lot of that has to do with how our individual ears respond to sound. Even though our brains can recognize and translate the same sounds um, sort of universally, our ears are all individual and different and hear them differently, like different microphones, right? Well, you know, all you got to do is uh, make your uh, a little circle with your, your hand and put it up to your ear or put, put your hand behind your ear uh, while sound is coming at you and you see how remarkably different it sounds. Yeah, exactly. So, so the, the simple fact is imagine inside the ear with the canals and the way uh, the the way the whole thing you know that you've grown up with and and has grown as you've grown, your ear uh, uses all those little little uh, nooks and crannies and stuff, and it has decided and determined over the course of your lifetime how those should operate and how those change the sound in your own ear so that things sound natural to you. So by by taking, you know, the the HRTF scans, you uh you you are able to provide that kind of information to a DSP uh unit which then, you know, uh translates that into sound that uh you will get a very a reasonably accurate representation. And as I said, uh all the all the headphone companies and so forth, they're all working on this stuff, but it's really turned into a science because uh, I know my friend Sean Olive over at, uh, Dr. Sean Olive over at uh, Harmon has been working for years on uh, figuring this stuff out. And he's also someone uh, over at JBL that they're working on these things too. Uh, everybody's on this and uh, it's just headphones are going to get better and better uh, over the over the next few years. It's very exciting. With so many game-changing Isotope plugins to choose from, deciding which one to buy next could be a bit of a challenge. But did you know that now you can have all their plugins through Isotope's new affordable subscription bundle, Music Production Suite Pro, for only $19.99 per month? Get your Rockstar extended 30-day free trial subscription now at isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plug-in purchase. 
Do you need to record direct stereo keyboards? Spectra 1964 now offers the Stereo BBDI 2 with custom wound high Z transformers for big headroom, virtually flat response, and a 15 dB input pad. The Spectra 1964 BBDI Passive Direct Box is also perfect for recording deep bass that will make your mixes sound huge. Plug that into a C610 comp limiter, and as founder Bill Cheney points out, it'll move your pant leg. Get your sound moving at spectra1964.com. I think the 3D immersive stuff is, is pretty fascinating. Uh, this is kind of a pivot, but one of the things that I got from my daughter this Christmas was I got her one of those Oculus Quest yeah. you know, goggles. And the experience of putting those on and even the way they just figured out how to point headphones, they're sort of like little mini speakers that point towards your ears. I'm really blown away with it. Yeah, um, well, it's a cool experience. That yeah, that and also the noise cancellation technologies and all the stuff they're coming up with are really quite remarkable. So it's gonna get it's gonna get much better over over time. You've have companies like Waves in uh, Israel who are have come up with they call the NX system, which uh, allows you to give to uh, kind of simulate putting headphones on, but it actually simulates what it, what what the speaker experience is. So you've got, uh, you've got a lot of stuff going on out there. That's, that's pretty interesting. Well, so let's talk about some of the uh, maybe less glamorous elements of your studio that allow you to work well. Um, watching you teach how to mix and teach how to take a big musical recording, which has just got tons and tons of tracks, instruments, vocals, all kinds of stuff and manage that all in a pro tool session you know, one of my questions is, you know, do you like to use a mouse or a trackball or do you use um, some sort of a D control or an Avid S1 or any of these interfacing tools that you find to be really useful for, for handling Pro Tools? Or do you like to just carefully, you know, kind of scoot around with a trackpad and find what you need and, and work with the mouse directly? No, I, I can't do that. I, you know, it, mixing with a mouse to me is like driving a car with a mouse. You know, the, the, uh, you know, it's just the, the steering wheel just works better. You know, uh, even though the mouse is, is, uh, more recent technology, uh, as far as, as mixing goes for me, a mix is a performance. And for me, uh, it's, it's a moment to moment performance. So as I'm mixing along and, uh, I feel like, uh, I'm in the, the second verse or something, and I say to myself, something else needs to happen here. I'm not quite getting that, that emotional arc that I'm looking for. I've got to come up with something. So that only comes from listening to it and what's come before it. So I need to have that uh, to get the emotional arc uh, of the whole tune. And I can't do that by bringing up this a DB uh, with a mouse or something like that. I, I have to have the faders at my fingers. And, uh, and I also, at least 50 or 60% of the time, mix with my eyes closed. So you can't do that with a mouse. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, research shows that with your eyes closed, with your eyes open, 70% of the information comes from the visual cortex. Um, with your eyes closed, suddenly you the amygdala is being triggered more by audio information than uh, it is when the eyes are open. Uh, this, is, this is well known, but it's also scientifically proven uh, with, uh, with scans that the amygdala lights up when the eyes are closed, listening to the same piece of music which when the eyes are open, you don't get that same, that, that same kind of experience. Wow. I like that. I like that explanation. I haven't heard that yet, but I've always felt it. Um, I feel like it's one of the reasons why I often will do these podcast interviews and, and decide not to do video because I feel like it lets me spend more focus on just listening to the words rather than um, sort of focusing on the eye contact and things like that. Um, and as far as mixing... With an interface, you know, I recently got an Avid S1, and I'm really excited about learning how to use it really well. Um, and, you know, mixing with a trackball has always felt to me, I, I equate it to sort of trying to play guitar with the tip of a pencil instead of being able to use your fingers and grab a pick in the other hand. 
Right. No, it's it's a it just like I said, one of my uh, I have a uh, an avid D command I have had for about six or seven years and I'll probably be moving to uh, I'm quite enamored with the um, the S4, which I'm thinking about, but I'm so good at working on this console and it's set up so well. I hate to get rid of it. I know Back in 1995, I started working on a digital console, which was at that point, the console I had uh, was a Neve Capricorn. And I just love that console. And to this day, I think it's one of the finest consoles ever made. Unfortunately, when we started by 2005, 2006, when we started doing more and more double sample rate stuff and things like that, it would not go above 48. And uh, it also had an old AT&T processor or processors in it that were no longer being manufactured. So uh, I had no choice but to have to move on to something else. But I was never quite as happy as I was on that Capricorn. It really was an amazing sounding and um, ergonomically beautiful desk. So now that I'm really comfortable with this. I want to make sure that all the bugs and so forth are taken care of before I get a new console, because even though I love the Capricorn, I spent three or four years during its development with constant, constant crashes and losing weeks of work and stuff. And, wow. um, you know, when I was younger, I could handle it. I don't I don't have that much time left, so I don't want to <laughs> waste it uh, good redoing mixes. Yeah, indeed. Um, were there any uh, sort of favorite records or mixes that come to mind from that time on the Capricorn? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, I love almost everything I did on that. There was Hourglass, James Taylor's Hourglass, which I had recorded on Martha's Vineyard. And uh, because we were recording just a... It was going to be just a rehearsal, and James hadn't put out an album in five years, or, or a, a new album. He had done um, a, a road album, but he hadn't done uh, an album of new songs, and he wasn't sure if he had enough songs or if they were ready yet, so we thought we'd woodshed for a couple of weeks up at Martha's Vineyard. So I went up there with uh, three DA88s, and... Uh, wow at that time, which, uh, with a brand new console called the Yamaha O2R. Oh, I know that uh, one. Yeah. And, uh, so, uh, we were one of the first ones to use it and I brought it up to Martha's Vineyard and we recorded Hourglass and we recorded it, mixed it, did everything up there. And when we got back to New York, you know, the plan was to recut a lot of the tracks and what have you. Uh, once we had done this woodshedding, so to speak, but we got back to New York, the stuff sounded amazing. And we said, you know, this is great. What, what are we doing? So we decided uh, at that point in time to simply uh, put on some additional overdubs like we got stevie wonder to play harmonica on a track we got branford marsalis to play uh you know soprano sax on a track you know we just got a bunch of people to to put uh, to play on different tracks uh, sting came in and laid a vocal down but 95 percent of the album was cut in the vineyard and once we did that i ended up mixing it on the capricorn and uh, I won my first two Grammys uh, right working on. on an album that was cut 16-bit, 44-1, on 3D88s. Um, and this was after years of working on the best and biggest Neves and SSLs and so forth, all of which I love. But it was really a, a um, eureka moment for me that uh, there was a new way to record, and uh, and it was digital. and. Uh, and not only could you record that way, but you could get something really exceptional if you, uh, if you took your time and you did it right. Atom Audio can provide all your monitor needs. Whether you are setting up a first-time home studio for recording music or podcasts, or a world-class studio for professional mixing and mastering, their unique accelerated ribbon tweeter design is famous for creating smooth, detailed imaging that let your speakers disappear into your music, allowing you to focus on the mix. Visit the Atom Audio YouTube channel for lots of cool free interviews, tutorials, master classes, and learn how to set up your studio monitor and control room. Just click the link in the show notes of this episode. 
The Jay-Z Microphone Vintage Series are built by hand in Latvia and feature the patented Golden Drop Capsule design for enhanced clarity that will give your recordings that classic vintage tone. Our friends at Jay-Z Microphones have come up with a special offer only available to you, Recording Studio Rockstars listeners. Use the limited time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the V67, V47, or the new V12 microphone at Jay-Z Mike.com. Great to hear you tell that story. First of all, Martha Vineyard is a beautiful place to be when the weather is nice. Um, and second of all, you answered the first half of one of the questions I, I had submitted from Brian Murphy over at Sound Porter Mastering, um, which was, you know, sharing a story about recording with the minimal gear there. But the other part of Brian's question was um, saying that he remembers that, uh, you had had quite a time getting the perfect mic technique with James in the studio and wondered if you wanted to expound on how you had to switch the mics and direct in and out during the mixing because uh, James would move while playing. Is there, is there a story you want to share about any of that well, stuff? Yeah. Well, that was, that, that was early on in the recording process. You know, um, I had a mic on his guitar and I had a mic on his voice, but James is not inanimate when he, when he plays and sings. Um, and I was realizing that, uh, between the two mics moving and all that, he was more concerned about staying on the vocal mic, but not so concerned about the guitar mic. And I was here, you know, uh, it was subtle, I admit, but I was hearing phasing things and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, I played around with a bunch of techniques and I finally hit on uh, this technique where I took a, a popsicle stick and I taped a um, what was then what's then called, I think, a Audio Technica ATM 35 which was a microphone, a small little like lav mic that we used to use for strings, bug mics is what we called them. And uh, I taped it to the popsicle stick and then taped uh, the top popsicle stick to his guitar so that, uh, and used that for the guitar mic so that when he moved the guitar, the mic moved with it. So I wasn't getting that, that, that phasing going on. And, uh, and it worked out uh, so well that we had a, we also had a DI on his, um, on his, uh, guitar on one of our, my favorite songs, the DI was, uh, cutting in and out on what ended up being our, our massively favorite take again, because we did this up on the vineyard and we were looking for vibe. I really didn't want to have to recut anything for sonic purposes. So, um, I just uh, lost the DI and uh, and only used it when um, when I would have to punch in a vocal line or something like that, and then you would hear the the bleed through. But oh, um, right. you know, but those are the kind of things you know, and you just get you you get to know after doing this for a while how to work with multiple mics and 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 go from say a direct mic to uh to an acoustic mic without uh without people noticing because this ATM 35 was so close to the strings I could get it a lot closer than I could have gotten a mic because it was taped to the guitar you really uh you know when the DI came and went you didn't notice it that's pretty wild i remember hearing stories about James Taylor's guitar sound and you know using really close um mics up near the strings and the fingers it, what was the model of the of the one that you taped on again it was an atm 35 which they no longer make it's now called the 350 i believe the up the updated version but i love that microphone it's a brilliant microphone uh in fact i think i sent you a video of an experiment I did at Berkeley with an orchestra. Uh, did did you get to see that? Um, yeah, I, I don't remember if I watched that one yet. I was I was uh, so immersed in the mixing one where you were showing us oh. how to mix. But we do have um, some videos that you sent over, and um, we will we will put a player in there, a Vimeo player, if we can do that into the blog post. Rockstars, you can check those out. Well, I'll tell you what the, the idea was. You know, I'm always looking for a new way or something better. Um, you know, I had a uh, Al Schmidt and I were talking uh, for an article we did for uh, Pro Sound News, and you know, he was saying 
I feel like I'm always learning. I'm always learning. Uh, and, and I feel the same way. I've been doing this for 40 years now, but there's always something else to learn. And I'm always investigating and experimenting because I've done some really good work that I'm very proud of, but I know there's, there are still things to, that could make it better. So I had this idea of, you know, uh, the concept being when you pick up an instrument and decide you want to play it, I think one of the things that, that moves you emotionally enough to cause you to want to spend hours a day learning it is that you love the way it sounds. Yeah. And you love the emotions that it, that it, that it, uh, instills in you. But those sounds are coming from your ear. They're not coming from a microphone in front of the instrument. They're coming from your ear listening to the instrument. And it's almost like it's, it's above and behind the instrument. So I said, well, what happens if I were to record an orchestra where every microphone in the orchestra, every instrument is mic'd from the instrumentalist's ear? So I called up the folks at Berkeley and I said, I'd like to do this experiment. And, and I then called uh, my good friend, Elliot Shiner, probably one of the greatest engineers ever. And uh, I said, Elliot, uh, I want to do this experiment and I want to compare a track, recording a track with the, the microphone at someone's ear, but I want to compare it against to recording it the traditional way. And I want someone to record the traditional way who's really great at it, who's one of the best there is. I don't want to just automatically have my thing sound better. I want to know if this really works or not. <laughs> so uh, Elliot said he'd be happy to do it. And we went up to Berkeley and he put me in touch with an amazing writer and uh, arranger there. But anyway, Alan uh, had written a song and was going to record it with, uh, I think it was five or six strings, maybe maybe seven strings. No, there's more strings, about eight strings, I think. You'll see it in the video. A bass, drums, a piano, saxophone, a vocalist, and a and two percussionists. So I recorded everybody with the mic, with a mic, this ATM, uh, this Audio Technica uh, 350 mic by their ear. Elliot set it up his traditional way. And we recorded it simultaneously and switched between the two different versions. I don't know. It, it really sounded amazing. Uh, people were like uh, the people that were watching and the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, instrumentalists were all quite quite amazed at how great it sounded, hmm. and um, I started working with the folks at AT to to actually manufacture a product. But then, uh, you know, as as happens, uh, things dragged on and dragged on, and I never and I got busy and wasn't able to follow through with it. But I'm hoping when COVID ends that we can do phase two of this with uh, uh, the folks at Berkeley. I'd like to do a big band trying it with this. And uh, now I, I use that in my normal recording for everything. And it's just, uh, it's quite remarkable. Uh, if you get a chance, look at the video. It's, uh, it's very interesting. That's um, really, really cool. Yeah. And I, I think too that some of the people that watched it uh, uh, or, or that wrote back to me, I think they misunderstood the object in the sense that this is not a uh, who's a better mixer, Elliot Shiner or Frank Filippetti, uh, you know, uh, th with the tracks. I would not be foolish enough to get into a mixing duel with Elliot Shiner. So <laughs> so that 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 wouldn't even enter into the uh, uh, question. Uh, what this was about was simply to listen to, as we were running the tracks down, switching between the, the, the traditional and this, this uh, other way. And if it, if it was a viable technique and if it also could bring something to the party. And what I think it brought to the party was the emotion 
that happens when you're not right in front of the instrument, but when you're at a place where the musician is playing to that emotion. So I think it was really quite cool. Have you tried the same thing, just sort of recording acoustic guitar or drums yes. or other instruments like that? Yeah, well, that's what we did. I that, mean, that's really that's, cool. Every, every instrument, the drums, I had uh, a stereo pair on the fella's two ears. Uh, he said it was the best, uh, the most amazing drum sound that he had he had gotten. He says he never heard a cymbal sound that way before. And um, um, uh, I didn't have enough of them, so I couldn't put stereos on everybody, which is what I would have preferred. But even the string section, everything just sounded, the bass sounded incredible. You know, instead of putting it in front of the bass, up by the ear, you had this incredible bass tone. And if you think about it, you know, the guys, you know, uh, the fellas who made the violins and the basses and so forth, um, they were listening at their ear. They weren't listening in front of the instrument. So I think there's something to it. The STX-100D from the Spectra 1964 Custom Shop is the big brother to the now famous STX-100, a fully discrete mic pre with dual transformer isolated Spectra 101 amplifiers. The STX-100D is exactly the same original circuit found in Stax, Arden, AdVision, a and and Record Plant recording consoles. The sonic performance is identical. Best of all, it will plug into a single space of your standard 500 lunchbox. And if you want to add the sound of the famous Spectra C610 complimenter, then check out the new STX600 modules, combining the STX100 mic pre and C610 into a single 500 module. Now you can get the same incredible sound in your studio that worked for famous producers like Tom Dowd with the STX mic pre's BBDI and complimenters. Go to Spectra1964.com or call 801 7 I love using Isotope plugins for my music and podcast productions. In fact, you're hearing Ozone and RX on my voice in this podcast episode. And now you can get access to all the Isotope plugins through the new subscription bundle. For only $19.99 per month, Music Production Suite Pro is designed for the serious recording, mixing, and mastering engineer, putting the finishing touches on music, film, and podcasts with fully pro versions of Ozone, RX, Neutron, Next. Neoverb, Tonal Balance Control, Visual Mixer, and more, including free plugin updates. And just for you rock stars, get an extended 30-day free trial subscription at isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plugin purchase. Coupon not valid for subscription. Hey, rock stars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Frank Filippetti, joining us from his um, colorfully uh, stained glass studio in Waterford, Connecticut. Are you ready to jam, Frank? Ready to jam. All right, good, good. Do you have a pipe ready? That's what I want to know. I got it ready. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so I'm a I'm a fan of pipe. The smell of tobi- pipe tobacco smoke. It's, it sort of can, smells very uh, smells it smells nice. I used to smoke a pipe when I was younger. Well, I have two favorite. Uh, tobaccos. One is, uh, they're both made by a company called Lane. And uh, one is uh, Lane IQ. And the other one is uh, the uh, Lane BCA. But, uh, uh, and then there's uh, uh, the Cult of the uh, Blood Red Moon is also very good. The so, Cult of the Blood Red yeah. Moon. Nice. Um, well, let me start out with another question from Brian Murphy again. Um, he had this one's kind of two questions. Uh, one is uh, that you were pointing out again that you, Frank, were an early adopter of digital recording. And would it be possible to hear any horror stories? Um, you, I feel like you shared a couple of successes with the digital start, but uh, any horror stories you remember from that, that time in the 80s and 90s? Oh, I mean, it's just it, it for for a long time, like I said. With the Neve Capricorn, I would be working with Phil Ramone. Uh, he was so patient because he recognized, as I did, how amazing this console was and how it sounded. But 
we'd work for, uh, you know, days on something and then lose everything uh, because this was the early days and and the uh, the technology hadn't kept up with the with, you know, with its capabilities. And we, you know, we really pushed it. So we'd constantly get breakdowns and crashes. And eventually Neve actually sent a, a technician just to live with us for a couple of months. Wow. And uh work with us as we kept getting, you know, working out the bugs. But also I remember we were doing, Phil and I were doing, um, uh, Elton John in, um, in London at, uh, it was with a symphony orchestra. We had recorded, we were recording Elton John at, um, a venue in, uh, London and with a full orchestra. And we were recording it on a a truck uh, where we had put uh, two R1 tape machines. Uh, R1 was a euphonics uh, digital machine for recording. The R1s went down for uh, a bit. We ended up losing, because it was a concert, and it was a live concert, and it was one night only, we ended up uh, going back to the studio to start mixing it and i said look don't worry we have we had da88s as backups mm -hmm. so we started to go to this one of the songs that uh, or the beginning of this song that we had missed and we put in the da88 backup and the da88 machine at the studio started eating the tape God. <laughs> so you know we're I didn't know what to do at that point, and I'm saying to myself, Elton is going to is going to freak. And somehow, I was able to. We were able to get the DA88 machine fixed, and we kind of uh, manipulated the tape. So we had to do it by hand. We had to rewind it by hand inside the cassette, and uh, we finally got it. So it played. And uh, we were able to transfer it uh, right away. And, and uh, but that took about six hours of work. It's, you know, it's just one of those things where when you're in the middle of it, you're saying, why did I choose this profession? And right. uh, or, or more often than not, it's like, I'm always trying to push the envelope. I'm always, I'm, you know, I'm not just satisfied in doing things the way I did it before. So I'm always trying new gear. And most of the time, uh, it all works. But occasionally, you know, you wonder, am I, you know, did, am I pushing my luck? Like, you know, when I when I worked with the O2R, I'd never worked on it before. It was a brand new piece of gear. I brought it up with James Taylor and it ended up turning out great. But, you know, there there was another time when we had the O2Rs. Um, I was doing Pavarotti in um in Modena, we used to do a show every year called Pavarotti and Friends. I thought I had this brilliant idea. Instead of using the uh, like this old uh, Rain Dirk console that we used to use, um, analog console. After I had that experience with the O2R, I says, "Well, why don't we do this this year? When we do it this year, instead of the Rain Dirk, let's." Let's just get like six O2Rs and join them together and do it that way. Because with the show, you had a bunch of different acts. You had Sting, and then it would go to the Spice Girls, and then it would go to Tony Bennett, and then it would go to Celine Dion, and then it would go to, uh, and in between each one of those, each artist would do uh, one number of theirs, and then they do one orchestral number with Pavarotti. So I said, with the O2R, I can just set up all these scene memories on the different O2Rs and call them up as the show goes on. And this is going to be so much hipper than, you know, having to do everything by hand on the analog console. Mm -hmm. It was working flawlessly. And on the third or fourth day of rehearsal, uh, there was a um, there was a, um, a hailstorm. And now this is like the end of May, early June, but there was suddenly a hailstorm, which took out part of the stage and also, uh, destroyed some of the gear and, uh, left us at the last minute, the night before the show, 
uh, with all our clocks and stuff all screwed up. And I didn't know if we were going to get it all back in time. And through the perseverance of us and and uh, Peter Traken, who was a Yamaha rep at the time, uh, doing everything we could and uh, working around the clock for 24 hours, we got it all up and working and it ended up working great. But, you know, again, it was one of those moments where you just say, you know, do I really need to do this? Why don't I just do it the same way each year? I know it works, right. you know, but uh, I'm always looking for something new. I'm always trying to get, let's say, the ultimate recording or the ultimate this. And when new gear comes along and I think it has an interesting slant on it, I'm I'm willing to try it. So. But You're an adventure. It, uh, yeah, but it's it's uh, it's caused me some agita. Uh, on the other hand, um, I've done things like you know when they called me up to do the Frank Zappa's 200 Motels mm -hmm. with the uh, with the uh, L.A. Uh, Philharmonic at Disney Hall. You know, I'd never done anything that size before, and uh, I just said, well, yeah, you know, I can do it. Went ahead with it, and it ended up uh, that ended up going great. And it was one of the highlights of my life was not only being there, but also being able to record that and mix it. It's He was really such a genius. And when you hear this the this piece which uh which we did uh you know which we re we released on cd it was just magnificent i just uh i loved it that's so cool and rock stars of course we have that in the show notes so you can just scroll through and go to the playlist to go listen to that i've always been a, a frank zappa fan ever since i was a teenager um any other stories from that particular session you want to share or what when you say there was <coughs> you know anything that big just how big was it well, we had about 200, 200 people on the stage. Wow. Um, we had, and, and Disney Hall isn't, isn't big enough for that, really. We had to lose all the risers for the orchestra. But, you know, Frank didn't write for just a standard orchestra. We had 16 winds. We had a double horn section. Uh, we had three pianos. We had um, three uh, classical guitars. We had a rock band. Uh, some of the old, uh, some of the, the folks from the mothers were there playing uh, for the rock stuff. Cool. And this was all on the stage at Disney Hall, uh, along with 12 performers who, you know, played the individual parts. Uh, and uh, it was uh, it was frightening and electrifying at the same time. And, you know, we didn't know uh, Gail Zappa is the one that put all this together. And to, you know, there are two people in my life, three people now who have disappeared or gone away on us, uh, who I miss deeply. And uh, Phil Ramone is one. Gail Zappa is one. And uh, Ed Cherney is one. And uh, Gail was just a force of nature. And uh, she wouldn't let anything get in her way. We wanted to videotape it uh, as well as record it. But uh, it, the because of the union regulations, it was so expensive, we couldn't do it. Wow. And, what, what was the year that you guys did that one? Uh, that? Probably 2015, 2016. Okay. And, and the sad part is that, you know, what I tried to say to the, you know, the unions and stuff, because I've, I've had many run-ins with them. I mean, I understand they're trying to protect their members and, and they want them to get paid. And I, I, I support that. But for me, you know, uh, this particular show, it's such a complicated show. Um, and with the, uh, with the, uh, um, the LA Philharmonic and so forth, because of their regulations, we only had, I believe one day of rehearsal for something this complicated, you know, we didn't know if it was even going to come off. Yeah. And we, you know, I'm saying to the union, look, we can't afford to spend that kind of money up front to videotape this when we don't even know if we have something that we can use. We don't know if this is going to come off. It's right. a, you know, it's a crapshoot. And, you know, and what I'm trying to say to the union is protect your members. But if we want to, if we let us record it 
And then if we think it's usable and want to release it, we'll pay you that money. Right, right. But if we if we can't use it or we can't record it, please don't stop us from documenting something like this, which is like a once-in-a-lifetime moment. Yeah. And as it turned out, it was a brilliant concert. Everyone was, was uh, supercharged, and it came out beautifully. But we'll never see it on video because, you know, it was just, it was like $500,000 to record it. Wow. So, you know, uh, but the, it was uh, a massive undertaking. Uh, I had uh, the best crew and support and uh, it just, it's one of those things where, you know, you go in totally petrified, but then, you know, it's... uh, the music, if you know, when when the musicians are on, there's no bigger high than than uh, doing something like this, yeah. and be and because, you know, and to be fair, look, I recorded this digitally, and I was able to put up like 150 microphones and record each microphone separately. So was this the same? individual mic thing as the Berkeley no, experiment? Not, no, not th- quite like that though. This was after the, the, the yeah. Berkeley experiment was like two years ago, right. but, uh, but this, you know, so I had all the instruments on individual tracks. So even if a microphone went out and some of them, sometimes they did. So, uh, y- you know, you can get it by ambience mics or something, but at least I didn't have to submix everything like you would have in the 24 track analog days. Right. You'd so really be on the e- spot there. Even though it was a huge and daunting task, in many ways it was easier to have 150 mics up there than to have 20 mics up there and try to get everything. You know what I mean? So yeah. yeah. So it there was, you know, I, I mean I didn't feel like that I wasn't gonna somehow salvage something. So Talk a little bit about that. So, you know, if we find ourselves recording a crap ton of microphones at a one one of you know one of a kind event, what's the smart way to capture that? How do you give yourself the backup? How do you give yourself redundancy? Because that's got to be part an important part of the process, right? Well, the first the first thing you do is nowadays in the digital world, because you can have your mic pre's on the stage. You've eliminated these long analog cable runs. The sound going into the mic pre is pretty damn good. And then you're running digitally by fiber optic to your console or your Pro Tools rig. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, you're not going to get the kind of issues that you used to have to get. I remember when we were, when we were recording, um, (laughs) <laughs> we were recording uh, Bocelli in Central Park, and uh, I had I had to park my truck um, a quarter mile from the venue because the stage uh, was built in Central Park, and again it was like a Pavarotti and friends in that we had you know Tony Bennett, we had Celine Dion, we had David Foster, we had uh, we also had Bocelli, and we had opera, and it was just a massive undertaking. But because of the size of the uh, the audio truck, we couldn't drive in the park itself. So we had to park a quarter of a mile outside the park and run lines from the truck to the stage, which were a quarter of a mile long. Wow. And uh, had we done that analog, you can only imagine what that would have sounded like. But we did it digitally, and so the sound came in, and it was fantastic. But um, uh, it was tough for me. I lost about 10 pounds that week because you know, during rehearsals and stuff, I couldn't just walk out of the truck and run up to the stage. Every time I needed to go onto the stage to talk to someone or to change a mic or whatever, I'd have to walk a quarter of a mile there and back. Nice. That reminds me a little bit of a story when David Hewitt was on the podcast talking about the um, record, uh, I forgot what was the name of the truck, the record plant um, remote, remote truck. Um, he was talking about how to do uh, Madison Square Garden. 
I think you'd have to be like five or six sub basements deep in the eight, ground. Eight, to, to eight, eight. You were you were eight floors below because I did Elton John one night only at Madison Square Garden. Wow! And you 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 wound up eight eight stories to get to the venue. That's amazing, and yep. that was pre pre digital, so it would have been analog well, or phone lines or something. He had a story well, about using phone lines I, for that. Yeah, but I did. I did mine, uh, Elton John. I did it digital. So nice. we we had a. I used the uh, uh, the uh, um, FNL truck, which had a Capricorn in it, which uh, again gave us agita because the Capricorn went down for about seven minutes during the show. Um, but luckily, I wasn't live mixing the show. And, uh, one of the things early on in my Capricorn experience, uh, I told them this was like, uh, this was around 2000 or something, but back in 95, when I first started working on the Capricorn, one of the first things I told them was if this console ever goes down, when that console crashed, it crashed and it wouldn't pass signal. Mm hmm and I said, the first thing you guys got to do for me is when this crashes, it's, it, it passes signal with whatever was the, the last, the last setup. In other words, wherever your faders were and all that stuff was, you've got to keep the signal going, even if I have to reboot. Right. And they got that. And because of that, we were saved that night uh, for Elton John. Because uh, the album was called One Night Only. So you know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> so what we we would have lost it had it not been for the fact that uh, it was passing the signal at least to the tape machine uh, to the, uh, I guess we were using then either the R1 or Pro Tools. But it was passing signals. So all those microphones still went to to disk. And uh, even though I couldn't mix anything or move any faders, at least I got all the mics. I, I had had a similar thing happen when I was at the Bonnaroo studio. Um, I think it was one of the first pre-Sonus consoles we took there. Um, and it, it froze in the middle of a mix, but fortunately the mix already sounded great. So I jumped right. over to the preamps and I started mixing on the preamps in real time. <laughs> Just adjusting yep. the levels, you know, and the yep. and the effects returns. Well, um, that would have been hard for me because I'd have to run up uh, eight flights of stairs to get to the preamps on stage. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, indeed. <laughs> Look, every studio needs a good vintage mic for that classic warm sound. Whether you're looking for those airy highs, sweet mid-range, or silky low end, a good vintage mic can put the magic in your mixes. So it's no wonder vintage mics have been loved and praised by thousands of engineers for decades. The Jay-Z Microphone Vintage Series are built by hand in Latvia using only the best electronic components and feature the patented golden drop capsule design for great detail and richness of tone that will bring that classic vintage vibe to your studio. Studio and be a real workhorse for your sessions. This time, our friends at Jay-Z Microphones have come up with a special offer only available to you, rock stars. Use the limited time coupon ROCKSTARS to get 50% off the Vintage Series mics V67, V47, and the new V12 at jayzmic.com. Adam Audio designs monitors with a mission to bring accuracy, transparency, and high definition to your studio, guiding you each step of the way on your journey from starting out in a home studio to installing your ultimate mixing setup in your pro studio. Check out their complete line of speakers and headphones from the T-Series to the AX Series to their top-of-the-line S-Series, which all use the unique ART accelerated ribbon tweeter design, famous for creating smooth, detailed imaging that let your speakers disappear into your music. Want to feel awesome to make brilliantly accurate creative decisions in your mixes because you can finally hear your music clearly? Your ears are the greatest instrument you have, and if you can hear the music, then you can mix the music. Visit the Adam Audio YouTube channel for lots of cool free interviews, tutorials, master classes, and learn how to set up your studio monitors and control room. Just click the link in the show notes of this episode. Well, all right, so here's another question from Brian again. Um, he was curious to hear 
uh, you know, if there were any favorite mics you wanted to talk about or particularly any, um, mics, maybe new ones. He, he, he phrased it, uh, mics you like so much today. So I don't know if he means, you know, recent mics that you're excited about new ones coming on the market or just stuff that you would, uh, you know, if you had to pick a handful of, of mics, what would be some of your favorites right now? Well, uh, oddly enough, one of my, one of my, uh, favorite mics would be the Audio Technica 3, 350, because mm -hmm. it's a small little mic, but it, Boy, does it sound good. And, uh, and and I love it, one, because of its size, and two, this is what I've been using for the ear thing, uh, the ear experiment. And it also, uh, you can change from omni to cardioid capsules. But uh, there's some great new mics. I got to say, you know, I love the mics, uh, the tube mics of the 50s and 60s and 40s. Um, you know, you can't go wrong with an M49. You can't go wrong with an M50, uh, a U67. One of my favorite vocal mics of all time is the uh, Neumann 269, which is the German tube version of the 67. Uh, I've used that on so many singers. Uh, but at the same time, I have to say, there's there's a, a slew of new microphones that have come out uh, in in the in the last say ten years or so, or, or longer that are just spectacular. Um, there's a bass drum mic now that I use for all my any time I do drums I use it, and that's the um, Audio Technica 2500. Okay. It's uh it's uh got two capsules. It's got a, a condenser and it's got a uh a dynamic. They're both uh time aligned inside the inside the uh the housing. So you have a condenser and a capsule uh condenser and a uh uh and a dynamic both coming through down two separate lines. Uh, because, you know, we always used to put, you know, we'd always put like a, a tube mic and then like a 47 or something like that. And then uh, a 421 or something like, you know, you put a condenser and a dynamic together mm -hmm. uh, on your bass drum. One for the 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 punch of the the dynamic, but also for the the frequency uh, response in the air of the of the condenser. So. Um, they put these two together in one mic, and it's spectacular because uh, before the days of of uh, recording digitally, where now you can just move uh, the two the two microphones into phase. Back, uh, you know, to 1995, 1998, I think it came out 99, 2000. You know, uh, it would do it automatically, You know, it was already set, ready to go. Then there are uh, uh, the one of my favorite. Uh, new vocal mics is the Audio Technica um, 5047. Instead of using a circular capsule, it uses four rectangular capsules. What that does is it increases the surface the surface area immensely, while at the same time each capsule is amazingly thin and small. So the the uh, the reaction time, the slew rate on them is is, is spectacularly fast. So you'd get not only the the great bottom end you get from a large capsule, but you also get the great transient response you get from a tiny capsule. Wow, that's interesting. So, yeah, so it's uh, and both as a vocal mic, it's it's superb. Then there's uh, uh, Senken makes uh, a uh, um, a microphone uh, called the uh, uh, 100K, which I've used now in place of. Uh, you know, the M50s, because they're so expensive and it's so hard to find uh, two or three M50s that are, you know, that sound the same. Mm -hmm. So when I put up a tree now, I'll, I'll, I'll use either the, uh, the Senken 100K or the uh, Audio Technica uh, um, uh, 5045, I believe it is. Then there's mics like the uh, Austrian Audio uh, that uh, they have a new microphone out that, um, allows you to to change patterns not only remotely but after you record you know there's all kinds of really interesting and and fascinating new microphones and by the way these little extra things that these mics do wouldn't mean anything 
if they didn't sound great, but they sound amazing. They have low noise. They have um, uh, a beautiful kind of uh, transparency. And they're not, you know, for a while, everybody was into these flat mics and stuff. I'm not into flat mics. I like the microphone to add some emotion. Mm -hmm. And I'd like it to add, you know, to to give me a spark emotionally. So, and for a while, a lot of the microphones just sounded way too nat neutral to me. But these microphones really, really hit the mark for me. And and I'll use those easily in place of uh, an old tube or something like that. And when I'm doing Broadway shows, I, di- I can't afford to have a microphone go down, especially a vocal mic. So when you're doing a Broadway show, you have to record the entire show in a day. That means all the instruments, all the vocals, everything. You have to do, you have one day to record and then the rest of your time is spent editing and mixing. Wow. And so, you know, you start at nine in the morning and you go to just before midnight and you cannot afford to have to lose a take because of a bad mic. So I would, I never use older mics on sessions like that. And they're all, you know, and I would use Senken CU44s, another great vocal mic, Audio Technica 4050s, 4050-47s. Audio Technica makes great mics. Senken makes great mics. BNK, you know, uh, well, it's now it's now called uh, what are they called now? Oh, uh, um, uh, which one is it? BNK? Sorry, uh, uh, DPK, D- 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 DP, DPA, yeah, yeah, yeah DPA, yeah, um, and. Uh, you know, Neumann is still making mics and these other, but these newer companies like Senken and Audio Technica and, and so forth are really coming out with innovative ideas. And they're not like, like I, I like to think that I'm not tied to an, the old way of doing things. Uh, I'm willing to try new things and I really applaud them because these companies are doing that. They're They're trying new things. And when they hit it, they really hit it. That's cool. I think the Austrian audio mic you were thinking of is the OC818, the new mm-hmm. one that has a, a switchable polar patterns yeah. and and also a, a and, Bluetooth remote. And 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 obviously, uh, starting with uh, um, the Royer, uh, the first Royer ribbons that the, the 122, I think it was, or 121. The, you know, they, they've they been making gorgeous mics. I have a Royer uh, tube, which is uh, phenomenal. So the figure eight mics that they're making and the, uh, I mean, there's just great new microphones that are, that are being made out there. It's exciting because the, uh, you know, the, the availability of microphones to get started in recording now is pretty cool. It's just oh, yeah. remarkable. And like and like I said, I recorded this orchestra at Berkeley with I think it's about a dozen or maybe twelve of these a- Audio Technica three fifty mics. They each go for about three hundred apiece. And Elliot recorded using, you know, studio mics, some of them, you know, three, four thousand dollars. And yet I think at least in my own biased opinion, I think that the recording we got holds up. I'm not saying it's better. I'm not saying, uh, you know, it's equal. I'm saying, but it certainly provides a sonic texture that I would not be embarrassed, uh, you know. And uh, it, it just goes to show with it, with a with the right setting and a clean input path and stuff, uh, nowadays, it, you know, if you if you know what you're doing, you can make the best recordings that have ever been made. And I say that saying, you know, uh, I'm not a big fan of vinyl, never have been. Um, and uh, I think that uh, high quality, uh, full bandwidth, uh, high res digital audio is the best thing that's ever happened to audio. And I also think that Never before in the history of our of audio have you been able in your home to hear exactly what I hear when I mix. That's and cool. You can, That's and cool. you can. Well, your records do just have a, a quality to them. Listening on the playlist, um, they just sound great, especially all these big live, um, you know, Broadway recordings and stuff too. There's a fullness to them that I immediately picked up on, even just listening in the car. You know. 
And you spent a lot of time, let me see, I've got a YouTube playlist or a video where you were teaching, uh, it's your mixing masterclass um, from MixCon, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's just a great one. And you really break a lot of stuff down. So I'm excited to dig deeper into that. Rockstars, you can find that in the show notes. Um, I want to ask you more about this, this little AT350 mic technique. If we were going to take a pair of these and try and record an album in our home studio, doing your listen to it from the, the uh, musician's ear, give us a couple of tips to help us pull that off. Do we need to like rig up some crazy headband that'll lock these mics onto our scal well, scalps well, or something like yeah, that. You'll you'll see you'll see it if you watch the video. What I did, I just took some Velcro, and uh, uh, I put it on the mic, and then uh, you know, uh, and then glued not glued, but you know, sticky Velcro, and then put that on the headphone. Oh, okay. So if the uh, what, if the if the musician moves their head, it moves the imaging a little bit. Yeah. Well, it doesn't really. You know. I mean, you know, that's one of the things we were thinking about. Well, what about the bass player? The drummer kind of moves his head. Uh, we didn't get that. There's, you know, and I'll tell you what else we got. I think because all the all the microphones were picking up from the same perspective. We got a phase coherency that I never heard before in one of my standard recordings. I mean, again, I have to refine it more, but there's something to be said about this. There's a dynamism and an emotionalism to it that I'm really quite excited about. <clears throat> and uh, I want to go to the next phase. Uh, but what we uh, but what we ended up doing uh, with this, was just to see if this even had a viability. And now that I know it's viable, uh, I really, at some point, want to get together with uh, um, either Audio-Technica or some headphone manufacturer or something and combine these elements into a microphone and headphone system that, that uh, anybody can use in their home. So that's cool. So it's like if you had sort of a headphone mic system, you could put them on and, and record with it, but you could also use the same one to listen back and hear what you recorded with the same, exactly. kind, of, same exactly. kind of a perspective. Yep. So in the, in the mixing masterclass, you know, I know one of the, you talked about a lot of great plugins. You were, you were talking about things like decapitator on different things. You talked about the importance of understanding how um, certain elements of, of recording and mixing in an analog realm brought something positive to a mix, whereas other elements brought something um, that was a hindrance to your mix right. and how you have to, you know, you kind of have to recreate some of those things that you miss in the digital world. And another another one was, um, you talked about, uh, you know, the power of using some of the isotope plugins. Um, you know, you talked about using Insight, for example, and I wondered if you wanted to just riff on any of those, any of those well, topics or any of your favorite plugins. Well, uh, insight is indispensable to me because uh, nowadays uh, it's too easy to get fooled uh, after listening for seven or eight hours about what kind of dynamic range you're getting on your mixes. It's it's you can you can very easily start pushing faders up and 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 forget the fact that you're you're squashing your dynamic range and those meters I have on all the time. And they keep me posted. If I if I start going down below minus ten or eleven, f you know LUFS, then I know I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm headed into some dangerous territory. So that I think is very important. But also there are uh, I don't even know uh, know if I I was using it back then because that goes back a few years. But there are some plugins that to me are indispensable. In addition to Insight, uh, it's now called Insight Two. But also, there's a, a plugin uh, called uh, by made by a company called Sound Radix, which is the um, which does uh, um, uh, is delay the comp auto align that one. That's the auto align, yeah. And what that does, uh, it's 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 helped me with drums. Uh, you know, I don't always get my own drums to record or to to mix. Uh, about 80% of what I get nowadays is from other people. 
And I was a drummer, and I'm very, very picky about how I record drums. Nice. And in, in, in fact, when I record drums, I do it slightly different than most people in that I don't align the overheads to the cymbals. I align the overheads to the bass drum and the snare. So that what I'm trying to do is when I'm, if I align the overheads to the, to the cymbals, um, and the toms, what I get is a hi hat all the way over to the left, and I get uh, and I get a snare drum that's over that's that's also left of center. Right. But I know in my final mix, I want the hi hat and the snare drum and the bass drum. I know I want them in the center, so I align my overheads so that they're at an angle across the front of the bass drum and you draw a perpendicular line from the bass drum through the snare and that becomes uh, the center of my overheads. So that when you listen just to the overheads, you'll hear the, the, you know, the high tom on the left, you'll hear the low tom on the right, but you will also hear the the snare drum in the center and the bass drum in the center. Yeah. So so I'm very conscious of phase on on the kit because as a drummer, uh, that's one of the things that really bugs me is is drums that don't sound like they're all working together. But in addition to doing that, Auto Align also brings the the snare drum and the overheads into alignment. Now, you know, your overheads are going to be two or three feet from the snare. And what happens is that means there's a two or three millisecond difference when yeah. the snare drum hits the overhead to when it hits the snare, because the snare mic is direct or, or it's very not close. direct, but yeah. it's very close. So what this does is this allows you to take the kit and and move the overheads forward in time so that they line up with the snare and if when i click that button bypass or on or off you will be amazed at how much tighter and and focused the the kit sounds so basically that's a plugin that i use all the time there's a thing called uh, they also make a plugin called surf eq which i use for the mm -hmm. bass because it's 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 a frequency sensitive. It's so you EQ the first harmonic, the second harmonic, because it 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 shows the you know. Uh, let's say you have a bass playing, and it goes B to F sharp to G to A, and you say I want to EQ the first harmonic. Well, it'll EQ B to F sharp to G to A. It'll EQ those frequencies as it goes along, That's or you want to EQ the third harmonic. So that way, instead of having this this static um, low frequency EQ that kind of muddies up the whole track. Now what you get is something that actually follows the, the harmonic of the bass. It's also good for problem vocals and for other things, but it's, it's, it's a remarkably clever plugin. Then there are, there's a, a plugin that Waves makes that I can't live without called the TGM, the TG Mastering uh, uh, plug-in and uh, it's made by waves and abbey road and it that basically models the a channel on the old tg console mm -hmm. uh that um uh, that they used to have at abbey road uh, not the tg what was the name of the console it was, uh, the, was uh, it the the red or the something like that the, no, the, uh, that they have that later. too but no this is the uh emi the, the the EMI console, yeah, that was yeah. Uh, 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 Abbey Road and stuff was cut on. Anyway, it's it's a gorgeous, gorgeous plugin. Um, it has a mode called uh, Vintage, which is just such a great, great compression, uh, and it really has that kind of Beatles kind of thing going about it. So I love that one. Um, I love. Uh, you know, I love the UAD stuff, uh, like the Fairchild. I mean, I got friends of mine who spend $30,000 on their Fairchild, and I have a dozen of them on my mix. <laughs> nice. You know, yeah. I, can, I can put them anywhere I want, and, and their emulation on that is really gorgeous. I got to tell you. 
you know, and uh, I used to say to people, when people say to me uh, about the UAD stuff, they say, well, does the, does the AMS reverb sound just like the AMS reverb or does the, does the Pultec sound like the Pultec? Well, what does the Pultec sound like? I had four Pultec EQs and not one of them sounded like the other. They were all, you know, the, in the analog days, they all sounded different. Their curves were different. Their cues were different. Everything was different. And what I am saying is this sounds remarkably like one of my better ones. And it's reproducible, uh, you know, from track to track. The OWC Envoy Pro Electron is the fastest, toughest, mini-sized, universal, portable USB-C SSD that lets you record from anywhere in the galaxy with confidence. With speeds of up to more than a gigabyte per second real-world performance, the OWC Envoy Pro Electron gives you high-speed audio data for recording and playback. Take your sessions and sample libraries with you anywhere you go. Built for reliability, the OWC OWC Envoy Pro Electron is waterproof, dustproof, and crushproof. Never worry about your storage and the safety of your music again. Find the new OWC Envoy Pro Electron and all your storage needs at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Perhaps a more appropriate question is, what, do, do 30 Fairchild sound like 30 plugins of the Fairchild? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, and you know, and it's it's... And now I can use them where and whenever I want to. You know, I don't have to decide, well, I've only got one Fairchild. Where am I going to put it? Yeah. You know, or I've only got, you know, two 1176s. Where am I going to put them? Well, well I, I can. I have the answer for you. You put them on the next overdub. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there's that. But in, you know, nowadays, like I said, I don't always get uh, tracks that I record. You know, most of my mixing is tracks that I, that someone sends me. Mm -hmm. So, so I then have to, you know, get them to sound the way I want them to sound for the mix. And, uh, the only way to do that now is to use some of my favorite plugins. Now, granted I could go, I still have analog gear, but a, about four or five years ago, I started realizing that the new stuff that they're coming out with is so good that I lost more taking a digital track, plugging it into an, an, you know, converting it to analog, plugging it into an analog piece, then converting it back to digital again, I lost more than I gained. <laughs> Whereas when I put the, when I put the plug in on, I, I, you know, I do what I want it to do. And as long as it's a, a, a decent emulation, go for it. Now, even if it isn't a decent emulation, if it does something that I like, cool. You right. know, so that's that's the other thing is, you know, it may not sound like this or it may not sound like that to to the, the best ears. But if it does what I want it to do, what I'm using it for, I don't really care. Do you feel a need to uh, keep up with the, the many, many, many plugins that are always coming out? Or do you find that sometimes it's like, how, how do you let new things arrive? Do you find that? the standard, you know, standard EQs and compressions, you, you've already found stuff that works great. And then you wait till somebody recommends something that's new and different. Or do you have, do you like to just go searching out there and see what's, what's the latest and greatest? I don't have time to go searching. I really don't. Um, uh, I have, I probably have four or 500 plugins at this point, <laughs> uh, about a uh, hundred or maybe 90 to a hundred that I use on a, regular basis. Wow. But uh, if someone, you know, basically the way it happens now is uh, someone will say, you got to try this or someone has, uh, you know, like the, the folks with Sound Radix, they, they contacted me, say, we'd like you to try, uh, you know, our, uh, this plugin auto align. I mm -hmm. tried it and I said, I can't live without it. So, you know, so many times I get, you know, people will send me stuff um, and uh, I'll try it out and love it. Oftentimes, too, uh, because I'm a, um, I'm a, a, a waves artist and a UAD artist, uh, whenever they come out with new stuff, I get it. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'll, I'll obviously I'll try like the TGM plugin. When I first got it, it, it just it changed my mix the way I mix because it's it's just so good. It takes up a lot of resources, no question. But again, that's the you know, do you want something that sounds great or do you want something that doesn't use up many resources? So you know, for me, if it sounds great, I'll just figure out a way to work with it. Uh, if I need to do it on more than a couple instances, then I'll just, you know, I'll freeze it on the, uh, on, on the particular track. Now, when you did the, uh, the mixing masterclass, which the video, which we got in the playlist, um, you mentioned that we might want to um, put a little pressure on George Massenberg to release some of his plugins. Well, the you world. Did, has, yes, has well we're still yet? applying. We're, we're still, still applying. applying. <laughs> Absolutely. He's, he's, you know, I, I talk to George once every two weeks. We have our Met Alliance call. Yeah. Uh, you're familiar with the Met Alliance, yeah, right? Yeah, well, I, that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you was to tell us about Met Alliance. And, well, and it's, it's, it's my favorite thing in life outside of my wife and kids. Um, but uh, Met Alliance is, uh, we formed that in 2005. And uh, it was, uh, it's currently is uh, myself, Elliot Shiner, Al Schmidt, uh, Nico Bolas, uh, our newest member, um, George Massenberg, Chuck Ainley, and then we also have um, we Ed Cherney, who was our founding member, and we lost him, and we lost Phil Ramon. But you know, these uh, these are the most amazing guys, and they're my favorite people on the planet. And we get to talk every two weeks, and sometimes more, but generally every two weeks we have a Zoom call where we all talk together for an hour or so, or. Uh, and go through our various projects. Obviously, this past COVID year, we generally, we try to do one of these Met Academies at least once a year. What we normally do with those is we uh, we book out an entire studio, like we'll book out um, Power Station, or we'll book out Capital Studios, or we'll book out, uh, you know, uh, something like that. And, and then we'll get uh, the three rooms, three rooms going, um, George and I might be in one room and uh, Elliot and Nico might be in one room and then Chuck uh, and uh, who did I miss here? Chuck and uh, Al would be in another room. George and I might be doing digital recording and mixing in one room. Al and Elliot might be doing uh, tracking a jazz band in one room. Back in the a couple of years ago, Chuck and uh, Ed Cherney would be doing a rock band in another room. Cool. And, uh, you know, so um, and it was expensive for us because, uh, you know, we try not to charge too much. We just want to make our money back. But, you know, we rent that we, we basically rent out the studios. And so uh, for, for a weekend. Uh, we don't just do an hour or two hours or four hours. We do a weekend. So, and uh, you can, uh, we divide the, we try to keep it to 30 or 40 people tops and we divide them into groups of 10. And then each group gets to go into each room. And uh, then we have a, a dinner at the end and we all just uh, converse about what they saw over the weekend. So very cool. that's one of our favorite things to do, but uh, because of COVID, we we haven't been able to do it, and we're waiting for the time we can do this again. But every two weeks, we talk about things. We're talking about maybe trying to do a, a virtual one or something, mm-hmm. but it's it's tough because without a studio, it's very difficult. So well, well, but, but, but this will come out later. So per, perhaps rock stars, um, yeah, you know, things will have changed by the time this is out. If uh, if that was the case, where would they go check out? Just frankfilippetti.com and they might find info uh, on the next or one? Me, or metalliance.com. Okay, great, great, great. So definitely take a look at that, Rockstars. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you another question. Um, well, first of all, Metalliance, what you just described sounds like heaven. That sounds fantastic. And like a, that would be a lot of fun to be there. So um, hopefully we do that again soon. Um, but I wanted to ask you a question also about when you were teaching the mixing masterclass, there was one thing that caught my attention. You talked about dividing up your your final mix into multiple bands. And I don't know if that's too deep of th- a topic to get into, but uh, is there anything you want to say more about like why you would divide up your mix that way and treat different bands of your mix differently? Uh, if you go back in history, you'll come across the name Alan Blumline. And Alan uh, did 
about 90% of all the research uh, that we now know to now know to be stereo. And reading through his papers, one of the things that fascinated me was you come across a, a segment where he said, when you have your speakers uh, 30 degrees apart from center, your left and right, you're not getting proper phantom center. And the reason you're not getting a proper phantom center is because of the, the wavelength issue. In other words, if you have a 60 hertz signal or a 100 hertz signal going into the left and right speaker and they're going in at the same time and at the same level, they will appear in the center because mm -hmm. the wavelength is longer than the distance between the ears. But once you get above 2, 3K and up to 10K where the wavelength is less than seven inches, six to seven inches, which is the, the distance between your two ears. Now, suddenly, a signal arriving into the, the left channel um, and one arriving into the right channel, depending on where your head is and so forth, they will be two, three, four, five samples out from each other. So what he said was, that as you get higher in frequency, it is important that you narrow the image. You narrow the stereo image so that uh, as you get higher in frequency, you keep the speakers from being too far apart. Um, that your, your, your head is the signal arriving from the left speaker is going to arrive five or six or seven samples quicker than that same signal in the left speaker arrives to the right ear. Right. And, and vice versa, okay, with the right speaker. So what you get is a smearing of your phantom center at high frequencies. Fascinating. And the way you can, and, and if you listen, uh, what I do is there's a, a plug-in called a Vita Vitamix or something vitamin, on uh, is that the one? vitamin yeah. on uh, yeah by uh, made by Waves, mm -hmm. but it can be any any plugin uh, where you can you can uh, change the bands or or come up with frequency bands. And what I've basically done is I've 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 cut vitamin into five frequencies. Everything below eighty five hertz, then from there to six sixty then from there to 2K, and then from there to, I, I can't remember exactly, but uh, I think it's around 8 or 8.5 eight, eight or something. But basically what I've done is split it into these bands, and then because vitamin allows you to change the, um, the stereo width on each one of those split bands, so the low-frequency bands I keep at zero, and then the high frequency bands, I start like uh, from 660 to 2K, I, I, bring, I, I bring it in just a touch. And from 2K to 8K, I bring it in just a touch. And from 8K up, I bring it in just a touch. So I'm, I'm narrowing the stereo width as we get higher. Wow. And what you will find uh, when you play with the numbers, and I got it to where I think it's really good, at this point, is you'll hear a much more cohesive center. It's odd because most people use these stereo width controls to widen things, but what I'm using them for is to narrow them. Yeah, it's and, fascinating. Uh, and, uh, but it really does work. And uh, so uh, I, I take uh, uh, the vocal band and I take the uh, drum band and I take the, the band band uh, a band, and then I take, uh, and then there's what I call a room band, which I uh, manipulate it uh, a little differently. But basically, they all go into their own little vitamin with uh, with this thing narrowing them, th them down, and it just creates uh, a more powerful center. That's fascinating. Well, I mean, I think of the records that you're making as often um, meaning to be experienced as a real high fidelity, you know, set up your speakers right, really recreate 
a soundstage for a big uh, musical or for orchestral thing. So it kind of makes sense to me too that you would you would have a focus on making sure that the imaging really makes sense. Right, and and again, it's it's or phantom image. This is this is not this is technical, but what the result is is emotional. If I didn't think that it emotionally provided me something, I wouldn't do it because it's a pain in the ass. But right. but emotionally it does. And when I when I bypass the vitamins on those channels, you can hear it. You can hear the smearing going on. And then you put it back in and then, oh wow, okay. So as long as I as long as I'm getting that emotional jolt, I'm you know, I'll do anything. Howdy, rock stars. Do you feel like the time you've spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks, and tweaking version after version of your mixes has gotten you nowhere? Have you been looking for a simple, straightforward, step by step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover the proven step by step mix system from Grammy winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Here are just some of the things that students are saying about the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass. This one comes from David P. Absolutely the most informative and helpful block of information and mentoring on the mix process I've ever been a part of. And Shane J says, I've literally watched it two times at length, taken a plethora of notes, then combed back over some sections even more. You really knocked it out of the park on this one, and it was so incredibly eye-opening and useful immediately. Look, it's a lot of fun to mix. I'm like you, but it can be really frustrating to keep doing the same things over and over again, but not getting the results that you really want. So when you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy winning quality, then go check out ultimatemixingmasterclass.com and get started now using the free preview button where you can immediately watch Craig's ultimate snare mixing trick. Happy mixing, rock stars. Well, thank you so much for for doing this with us. I have one more question for you, unless there's anything we didn't cover yet. Um, and well, we, I, yeah. didn't, we didn't uh, cover uh, Terry Bozio's drum kit when I was working with Corn. But oh, that's okay. let's do that. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, man, was, tell us about that one. What was that record? That was. Let's see. Uh, I did Untouchables and Look in the Mirror, and uh, I think it was the third. I can't remember. But uh, Terry Bozio, uh, uh, this was after David Silvera left the band. Terry came in, and we put down a bunch of tracks. And his, I mean, I mean, he's amazing. His kit is amazing. For me, what was what what made it so uh, unique an experience is. You know, he has like five bass drums. I think he has like 20 toms. He has, uh, you know, it's just, it's it's an incredible kit. And he uses them. This isn't like bullshit. He uses them. And, um, but in any event, I ended up thinking about it like an orchestra. You know, like I, if I was miking an orchestra, you know, but everybody was that close to each other, what would I do? So, but it, it really was uh, quite an experience. And he's just, he's a, He's a master drummer in a, yeah. in a totally different way of the master drummers like Russ Kunkel and uh, um, and Carlos Vega and 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 folks like that, but or Steve Gadd, but he is uh, truly uh, unique. Now, was Terry part of the 200 Motels performance also? No, uh, no, uh, that was um, no 200 Motels was uh, played by uh, Joe Travers, and we also had. Uh, a couple of fellows from the uh, the mothers uh, playing, and uh, it was uh, it was very cool. It was very cool. But uh, Joe is an amazing drummer himself, although he also doubles as the vaultmeister. That name comes from the fact that he kind of sits over and watches over the vault of Frank's all all Frank's stuff in the vault oh, that really? Frank built. Yeah. Oh wow. Um- I can think of a way that you could have made it easier on yourself to record Terry Buzio's drum kit, though. Yeah, one, one in each year. Yeah, I just put one of those ATM yeah. 350s yeah. on each year and call it a yeah. day. No, I did that. But, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, this is, 
But, you know, there's so many timbres on his kit that you really want to get them. And, uh, it, you know, and with a corn album, it's very important. Uh, you know, I work with them on three albums and they are they are really unique and and they have a sound that's like nobody else's. And one of the things that is very difficult but very necessary in working with them is to really understand all that low end because you have guitars that are tuned down. Mm -hmm. You have, uh, you know, a fieldies bass, which is, uh, you know, um, uh, which is a unique sound of his own, plus David's drums or whoever's the drummers. And, you know, Monkey and Head are playing these guitars uh, with, you know, uh, with low D's and low B's and all that. It's, it's just, there's a lot of low end information and, uh, to keep it powerful and, and not muddy, you really have to carve out these areas of, of response. And so having like a microphone or one or two mics over a whole kit would just cloud up so much of that low end. Mm -hmm. Now, did you mix the stuff that you recorded with them and would you have used some of the similar techniques that you were just talking about with the multi-band um, narrowing of the image and things like that? Uh, I don't know that I was, uh, I, yes, I did uh, mix two of the albums. I don't know that I was doing that at that point. Okay. I think, I think that that probably came along around 2007, 2008, something like that. Okay. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you for sharing that. That was really cool. Um, this is, this is a closing question. Now this one's hypothetical, Frank, get to take the way back studio machine and you can go back and find young Frank. Um, gosh, where was young Frank when you were starting <laughs> out, but you can go back and give yourself, um, a bit of advice and you say, listen, dude, here's the most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the recording studio yourself one day. What advice would you go back and give yourself if you could? Well, what I would say, uh, what, what I say to, uh, to students and things when I do uh, master classes or, or uh, residencies at, at uh, schools, I say, look, when you get out of high school and you go, you either go to college or you don't, once you're, once you're out of school and looking for something to do, that is the first and only time of your life that you have no one to be responsible for but yourself. You know, while you were growing up, you were responsible to your parents then you're responsible for your classwork and your school. Later on in life, you're going to get married. You're going to have children. You're going to be responsible then. There's really this one window in your life where you can do anything that you want to do. And if your passion is to do this, to be an engineer, mm -hmm. and you are and you are willing to live in a in a a one room walk up that uh, that where the bathroom is shared down the hall and uh, uh, to make it and to do to do this because you have the passion for it. Now is the time to find out. You know, some people try to be safe. Oh, I'll come back and I'll do this maybe later. I started late myself. I was a singer songwriter. And I kicked around New York as a singer songwriter for about nine years. And one day, uh, well, it was about uh, the week of my 30th birthday. I, um, um, I had found out that, uh, my record company went, uh, went bust life song records. My publishing company, screen gems, coal gems decided not to pick up my option. And my girlfriend threw me out of our apartment. <laughs> um, and I was living in New York with no job, no money, no nothing. And I said, you know, I've always liked to record. Maybe I should try that. So I started a little late, but I have to tell you, once I started it, it was like, this is what I want to do the rest of my life. Now, yeah. the sad part today is that when I started, I was able to get hired by a studio as an engineer. Nowadays, there are very few studios left, and those that are there don't generally hire staff engineers. Mm 
Mm -hmm. But when I started, there wasn't, uh, we hadn't gotten to the independent engineer yet. But the thing is, is I say this to everybody. If you have talent and you have ambition and are willing to do whatever it takes to make it, you will make it. I absolutely believe that talent at the end and ambition will win out. But you may have to go through a lot of lean years to do it. But I say, go for it. Go, you know, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine back in those days when I was a singer songwriter that just a few years from then, I'd be working with James Taylor and Peter Asher and George Michael and Delton John and, you know, Rod Stewart and all these people that were my heroes. And I was trying to get songs to as a songwriter and I never could. And suddenly I'm in the studio with them. Um, it was, it's like, it's, it's been like a dream come true. But the thing is, the one thing I think that helped me and that really made my career happen quickly was the fact that I was a singer songwriter for so many years. And I remember going in to do my songwriter demos at a, at a demo studio for Screen Gems. And I'd say to the engineer, you know, can you do this or can you do this? I, I, as this? I don't think the voice is bright enough or I'd like more of this on the guitar. And they look at me like, who the, f- well, who the hell are you? <laughs> you can swear you know? on this if you need oh, okay. to. Okay, who the fuck are you? Yeah. And, and, uh, and, you know, because you're just, a, you know, you're just the guy that wrote the song for Christ's sake, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and once I started on the engineer side, I always remembered, that I am here because of them. They're not here because of me. I'm here because they wrote the song. Mm -hmm. I'm here because they're the artist. I'm here because they have a vision. And for me to ignore that vision is just would be a travesty because I know how badly I felt when my vision for my baby was being ignored. And I think that was something that always stayed with me. Now, that doesn't mean I didn't argue at times with with, uh, uh, someone I was working with or producing. Yes, but I always had in the back of my mind, it is not my record. It is their record. And this is the most important thing. I'm in a service business. And as much as I like my own creativity and I like to be creative, I am there in service of the artist. And I think as long as you keep that in mind, you're going to have a great career. If you think you know it all and you think that you have no business listening to these people, then good luck to you. (laughs) Oh, man. Frank, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. What what an absolute pleasure to meet you and to just get to listen to you and, and hear some of your stories uh, please let the rock stars know where, where can they go find you online? Where would you like them to go check out your stuff? Um, what if they're ready to make their next hit record with you? Uh, well, they can, they can contact uh, Joe D'Ambrosio, who's my manager. Uh, he's, uh, he's in uh, Mamaroneck, New York. Uh, so you can contact Joe D'Ambrosio Management. And uh, you can also uh, go to my website, uh, frankfilippetti.com. And uh, I haven't, I've got to look at it more, but uh, it's still kind of old. But um, I think it has a cool um, reel. I think you put together a demo reel video on there too. That oh, no, yeah. Records. Yeah. Well, actually, a friend of mine did that. He said, I, I, I put this together for you. What do you think? And I loved it. So he says, Yeah, Jesus, that's, that's very great. nice. So talk to Joe or, or, or get in touch with me. Um, and, uh, um, I also have a Facebook page uh, or Facebook something or other. I don't know. I, I'm <laughs> we'll not, find I'm it. Not, we'll find you. Yeah, I'm not very good with that stuff, though. That's all right, man. What a pleasure. Um, Rockstars, of course, a reminder, we'll include links in the show notes, so you can also just scroll down and click right through. Um, Frank, I hope I get to meet you in person one of these days. Um, I, I Occasionally, I'm through Connecticut, and uh, maybe yeah, we'll see you at the next on, event bye. in New York, too. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm I'm within I'm about five miles away from Power Station, New England, uh, which oh, is cool. 
which is a brilliant studio. I mean, I used to work a power duo, uh, you know, uh, once my right track studio closed, um, I would do all my Broadway shows at Power Station. And uh, now I walk, uh, I'm here in Waterford and I walk into that place and it's like I'm in Midtown Manhattan. It's just stunning. So I'm very fortunate to have that nearby. But anyway, absolutely. You're welcome to come by anytime. That is a beautiful spot. Yeah. Um, we, in fact, we just had Evan Bakke on the podcast not long ago from Power Station, New England. Really cool place. Um, and it looks beautiful. Yeah. No, it's fantastic. Well, thank you again so much. Um, and we will see you around the studio, dude. You bet. All, All right. right. Cheers, Take man. care. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who have helped make this episode possible. OWC, Adam Audio, Spectra 1964, Isotope, and Jay-Z Microphones. Remember to use the coupon codes ROCK10 at isotope.com slash rockstars for 10% off any plug-in purchase or start your extended 30-day free trial subscription to get access to lots of plugins and Rockstars at Jay-Z mic.com for 50% off select vintage series mics for a limited time. And remember to visit the Adam Audio YouTube channel for free interviews and masterclasses and use the coupon code ROCKSTAR for 10% off any course at Recording Studio Rockstars Academy for a limited time. You'll find links to all these wonderful sponsors in the description of this podcast. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to thank our fantastic team team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko, Braden Streming, and John Richardson for additional podcast and video production. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.